and they talk about our, uh, our cinema. Okay, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Xi Zhuo. I'm a global strategist at the Higher Language Finance Institute. This is our eighth episode of our of Green Development International Seminar Series, where we will invite international experts and economists sharing their insights related to sustainable finance in general. Today's seminar is called Climate-Related Financial Risk, Modeling and Policy Method. Now let me introduce our main speaker, Dr. Pete Chenet. Dr. Chenet is a leading scholar in the area of climate-related financial risk. Currently, is a co-founder and uh, now executive director of the Two Degree Investing Initiative Think Tank. And he's also a uh, climate and sustainability interdisciplinary research, holding an honorary research uh, associate position at University College London, UCL, and a research associate to the Chair of Energy and Prosperity in France. Today, he will address the question of climate related financial risk at the interface of modeling and policy making, especially for you know, financial regulations. Then, after um, Dr. Chinese's talk, we will have a brief discussion and Q&A session. Um, you can either raise your hand in Zoom or you can leave it in the chat box. Uh, we'll pick some questions. So now, without further ado, let me bring you Dr. Chinate. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and for the invitation. Let me just uh, make a few adjustments so that I'm fully ready. Um, I, I need just a, two seconds. Okay, this is good. And let me share my screen so that you can see the slides I prepared for today. It's, uh, um, I cannot see it yet. Sorry for the delay. It should be okay now. Can you confirm it's okay? Okay, good, perfect. So thanks a lot again. I'm very, very happy to be, to be here with you today. So I, I reworked a little bit uh, this morning, the, I mean, this morning here, I'm based in, in Paris. So it's about 9.30 a.m. Here I reworked a little bit the, the title to, to give you something more, more precise. So um, the topic of my talk today will be climate-related financial risks, modeling and policy making with a pinch of biodiversity. As you will see, I will try to expand uh, this topic, which is currently very focused on climate to other related, uh, to other environmental related um, issues. Um, <clears throat> okay, so may maybe just as the... Um, uh, a bit more uh, introduction to, to what has just be, been said. Um, in terms of profile, I think I have maybe a, a I don't know if it's original or exotic uh, profile, but I, I was trained as a geophysicist. Uh, my PhD was in uh, geophysics and, and uh, planetary exploration at the Paris Institute for Earth Physics. And I then worked as a researcher at the JAXA, the Japanese Space uh, aerospace Ag exploration agency and about uh, 15 years almost 20 years ago actually now i switched to uh, to finance and uh, risk environmental risk in finance through uh, a consulting company otc conseil otc conseil and about 10 years ago i created a, a think tank called two degrees investing initiative um, with whom I worked for about five years and um, I left it five years ago to come back to academia. So now I'm five, six years. I'm, I'm now fully in academia and actually I'm no more uh, um, a non-executive director of, of this organization for about two years now. Um, so I, I co-founded it, but I'm no more involved with, uh, with what they are doing, but they are doing great. And there are now about 40 uh, people working in on different continents. So now I'm fully uh, on finance and sustainability in academia. And my um, main affiliations have been uh, summarized quickly. So I just give you a, a hint of some details here um, if you are interested. So mainly all the, the below 
uh, the, the bottom part of the of the screen is related to teaching assignments uh, I do have uh, in, in different uh, universities and, and business schools. But everything is related to, to finance and this sustainability. And a bit like my talk today, very focused on, on climate change and actually biased on climate change and a bit less on other stuff such as biodiversity. But I try to correct this and to go more on non-climate environmental related uh, things uh, for finance. So it's quite, that's why I spend a bit of time on this because it illustrates also what I'm doing in my perspective. So <clears throat> my presentation today will be uh, essentially based on two papers that have been published recently, uh, last year. One, um, one paper in, uh, published in Ecological Economics. I'm not sure you can see the title, so I can read it for you. Uh, Finance, Climate Change and Radical Uncertainty Towards a Precautionary Approach to Financial Policy. And another one, which is a much shorter piece called Understanding the Financial Risk of Nature Loss, Exploring Policy Options for Financial Authorities. And um, the kind of wrap-up and specific perspective I give you today is actually uh, the base of a paper which is currently under review called uh, Breaking Down Silos, Financial Risk and Environment uh, Beyond Climate Change. So that's that's my, my perspective, I would say. Um, maybe to as a kind of introduction, what can be useful for for um, for some of you is to show the different topics. Uh, it's quite an interdisciplinary work, so the different topics that we touch upon in in, in this uh, in this work. So <clears throat> I, I pasted here the different uh, journal of economic literature uh, codes that we are building upon. So you see lots of different things from climate, environment, global warming, etc. Ecological economics, um, especially here related to um, the additional layer on ecosystem services, biodiversity conservation. All in all, it's really financial markets and macroeconomy, but with a focus on central banks and um, supervision, financial supervision. And, um, and as you will see, we kind of challenge a little bit as well. So it's just a thin layer, but it's quite important as uh, a notion of information and market efficiency. So that's my, <clears throat> I would say, uh, perimeter, which is quite broad. I agree. So please feel free to, uh, to, to ask me uh, if any clarification is needed. Okay, so quickly... <clears throat> the brief outline of, of my talk, um, quite um, quite long introduction. I think the context is important because, uh, uh, as you know, this field of this broad field of sustainable finance uh, is new, but still um, reaches a lot of different points and perspectives. So even if we are all more or less work in the same field, uh, we may not have exactly uh, the same uh, view and the same type of, uh, of questions. So uh, I will insist a bit on that before digging more into details, especially on climate-related financial risk, so CRFR. Extend that to biodiversity to see how far it's the same or different and what it brings to the problem. And then uh, open a door, I would say, open a window on um, after setting uh, the scene with all these problems. What can we do or what shall we do um, before concluding? So, also, yeah, in terms of time management, if you see that I'm starting to talk too much and be too long, uh, really feel free to. Uh, to raise flags and, and let me know that uh, uh, I may be talking too much. So the beginning of our story, I could have made that start earlier, but I think the main big event is probably in 2015, so two events in parallel. Uh, I hear some, some background noise, I'm sorry, but uh, if, it, if not needed, maybe uh, um, it's better to, to, to mute microphones, um, but feel free to interrupt me anyway. So it's, uh, yes, the, the first, I think, big uh, thing in our field uh, is certainly the Mark Carney speech in 2015, the tragedy of the horizon. It's very, very important for what I will uh, discuss today. Where my takeaway, maybe not shared by everyone, but my takeaway from it is the focus on disclosure and reporting um, as a solu uh, of financial risk themselves from coming from climate change as a solution to break this tragedy of the horizon. So it's it's quite a strong message. 
uh, it was very impactful and marked, if not everyone, a lot of institutions uh, worldwide, and is still considered as the main trigger for a lot of things happening on, on climate and, and finance. And the second thing, which is much more, even much more institutional, but uh, a bit less precise, maybe, is coming from the Paris Agreement, uh, Article 2.1c, which is the third big uh, overarching goal of the agreement, which highlights the role of finance in the fight uh, against climate change, especially this sentence, which is now very famous, uh, where the Paris Agreement signatories have to make finance flows consistent with a pathway towards uh, low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient de development. If you are interested in this specific paper, um, uh, we wrote a paper with uh, Luis Damarioli uh, last year on um, uh, Nature uh, Climate Change, which was published by Nature Climate Change, climate change sorry, on this very um, issue of the article 2.1c. Um, I can give you the details later on or, or by email if you are interested. So, <clears throat> um, so the takeaway from this, sorry, I have to clarify my voice, <clears throat> clear my voice. The main takeaway from this, I think, uh, for, for our discussion today is from the regulator, financial regulator, supervisors and central banks point of view, where it is now agreed, there's a quite a broad consensus uh, in the area, that climate change poses material risk to the economy and the financial system. Okay, oh, I have uh, an echo. And um, so price and financial stability is at risk. Okay, that's agreed as a kind of a given and uh, the starting point. Um, as a second point which come with that, uh, together with that, is the fact that manage the management of those climate-related financial risks, the CRFR, are in agreement with the mandates of, broadly speaking, central banks, even if uh, we will talk about that, certainly, there are differences. Okay, but it's logic that central banks and supervisors work and take care of this. Okay, I make a quick break just to check uh, I, I heard um, some some beeps and noises. I want to check that uh, there is no uh, message in the chat box. But I, I cannot see the chat box actually. So in case there is anything, I, I would prefer you tell me uh, uh, through the microphone. Thank you. No problem. I'll let you. I'll let you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. So this <clears throat> move, I would say, is very recent and is illustrated very certainly by the. Um, creation of this network uh, called NGFS, the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system. So this network has been created in 2017, so it's really recent. At that time, there were only eight central banks and supervisors uh, involved. And now <clears throat> I checked this morning again because it's moving very fast. Last update was a few days ago with more than 100 members and 17 observers. So it became comes and it became like the place to be for, for central bankers and supervisors related to this question of uh, greening the financial system. When you have a closer look, actually, the, there are two objectives. First one is to enhance the role of the financial system to manage risk related to, um, to, to the greening. We'll, we'll come back to that. Second one, to mobilize capital um, for green and low, cap and low carbon investment, which is the second, I would say, priority, and actually quite less priority, less of a priority, I, I think, from my understanding of what's uh, being uh, dealt with. Okay, so the focus is really on, on the problem of risk, which is natural, probably, uh, for, for supervisors in particular. And the, the NGFS works on, on five different uh, streams that all touch upon uh, risk um, to, a, to, to a different extent. So if we are back to, to this, initially, as I mentioned, the focus is supposed to be on green because the, the name of the, typically of the NGFS is greening the financial system, but very focused on climate first, okay? But increasingly, beyond, I mean, in the broader ecosystem, uh, our financial ecosystem, I would say, uh, we see that it's not only about climate. We also have problems 
more broadly uh, with biodiversity, in particular with services that are provided by the biosphere. So last year was a very important year for this because the, um, in the UK was released uh, the Das Gupta report on, on um, biodiversity services and economics of biodiversity. And it had a strong impact everywhere, not, not just uh, in the uh, in the UK. And so the idea is that um, services coming from Earth from bio um, uh, from ecosystems such as clean air, fresh water, fertile soils, disease regulation are given by nature, and if this um, uh, endangered, we will suffer from it. We as humans, but also we as society and ecosystem and um, economy. And as a matter of fact, if the economy is threatened by such uh, dangers, by such uh, problems, of course, the financial system will as well. Okay, And the situation is bad. So the best the, the international organiz organization taking care of uh, analyzing, uh, I mean, it's not an organization, I would say it's a gathering of, of uh, scientists working on biodiversity and ecosystem services, raised all the red flags you can imagine because the situation is very bad. And as a consequence, there's an increased attention on this question of biodiversity loss for economy, for the economy and for uh, the financial system as well. As a consequence, if we are back to um, the NGFS, which perimeter, as I mentioned, is green. It's not only climate, it's environmental and sustainability. Launched also a, a new work stream, I would say, not really a work stream, but a side one, a side working group on biodiversity and financial stability last year. Um, I'm, so two, two pre-reports, I would say occasional papers, relatively short papers have been released already, and it's exactly on that topic. So I'm part of one uh, of this group um, of researchers contributing to, to that work. And we, um, uh, the NGFS and Inspire, which is the working uh, working group uh, program uh, will uh, release um, the main report next month if everything uh, is fine okay so let's start that's for the context so let's focus now on crfr so if you followed me climate related financial risks okay so the narrative on this is very clear and put forward by the NGFS in particular. It's about action, okay? So I like this sentence from the first NGFS report, why the financial risks may be realized in full over extended time horizon. Okay, we're talking about long term here. The risks call for action in the short term to reduce impact in the long term. So that's really the narrative about climate mitigation in general, not just for finance, but this comprehend uh, this understanding uh, has been used as well just to justify actually uh, the action of uh, central bankers and supervisors. But in the same report, and you can see that in all publications related to uh, financial risk related to climate um, for supervisors and, and central bankers, we see that the immediate action, which is called upon, is actually a bit delayed because as always, uh, watch out. It's not that simple. We need to understand more, okay? So there, and it's actually written in that sentence, there is a need to build intellectual capacity in translating the science into decision useful financial risk assessment information, okay? So that's very important because in the same papers, almost all papers, it's written like we need urgent action the, the extent of the threat is so huge that we need to act now and every action will reduce the risk in the long term. But there's always a but later on, which is, okay, more research is needed. It's not clear yet what we can do, how much we can do, how we can do it, etc. So finally, at the end of the day, there's not much action. Okay, so that's my perspective. You may disagree because things are indeed moving fast and it's quite dyna dynamic, but it's still not very uh, active, okay? And typically, if we look at uh, what the NGFS uh, publishes and uh, all the central banks, especially in Europe, in what I would say, right? Uh, Bank of England, Bank of the Netherlands, Bank de France, um, a lot of voluntary guidelines on what to do. So it's not like 
there are compulsory things uh, related to this and, and, and concrete action, and a big focus on stress testing and scenario-based uh, risk analysis. So that's the main outcome as of today, even if it's moving, but um, I would say that's the, our starting point. This is to illustrate the fact that there's clearly a focus on uh, climate stress testing uh, by those different uh, organizations. You probably are aware of even familiar with those, um, with those reports. Um, so this narrative actually raises a number of questions because if we need more intellectual capacity to act while we know that we need to act as, now, as soon as now, okay, we can raise the question, well, when will, will, will we have this intellectual capacity? And when will we have it or when actually can we have it? Okay, that's a real question and uh, that will, I will focus on uh, in the rest of my talk. Relative to uh, scenario modeling and stress testing, what do they actually mean for policy intervention, for real regulatory action? Is it just for sending useful signals to market so that they adapt and, and do their job alone? Or are there a prerequisite to quantify, to, uh, um, to um, frame properly uh, the financial policy decisions that we need? And after it opens a lot of very complex and detailed questions, typically on time horizons, what does it mean to work with a 30, 50 years time horizon, even 60 years uh, for, for some of the, the problems that are raised by, uh, by the Bank of England, typically? When we are talking about such long time horizon, what concretely are we stress testing? Do we use today's balance sheets with events, shocks that can happen in 50 years from now? What does it mean? Is it meaningful? Um, do, can we imagine a balance sheet that evolve in the future to stress them in the future? So it raises a lot of questions related to these long-term things that today we don't really know how to address that. I mean, at least I think it's not very, uh, um, uh, very satisfying. Um, and on top of that, which starts to be Mm, I would not say mature, but more mature because it, it started a few years ago already. We tend to add biodiversity and adding biodiversity on that, may, does it make it our problem easier or actually more complex? Does it help or is it actually an, an additional obstacle? That's what we will deal with. So to come back to the um, fundamentals of what we are talking about, usually those uh, climate-related financial risks are um, divided into two main categories. Um, physical risk and transition risks. I won't go too much in the detail of that, but basically, on one hand, is coming from directly climate change itself, direct impacts. The other one, more from the socioeconomic side, reactions, adaptation, anticipation. And you can put into that everything related to policies, to technology, to uh, consumer preferences, to litigation, et cetera. And clearly there is a trade-off between the two because the more mitigation of climate change you do, the more transition risk you have, and hopefully the less physical risk. Reciprocally, if you don't do anything, well, you don't have much transition risk, but you will have a lot of physical risks instead. Okay, so you have a trade-off between the two and the trade-off is also in time because you can act tomorrow morning with very strong regulation, for instance, Next week, there can be a new uh, um, innovation changing totally our, our problem. But climate change is a long pattern um, of things unrolling over several decades. And we expect the main uh, threats uh, quite in the long term, even if it already started. Okay, so all that to say that what we are dealing with are um, characterized by very specific patterns that are quite original when we talk about finance. Typically, you see the time horizon we are talking about are really far compared to usual finance. Events and trends and, and facts that we are describing are mostly unprecedented. We don't have them on records. A significant amount of them are irreversible. Okay, so no back to equilibrium. Endogeneity very strong on, on the genity. I mean, it's the financial system builds, the, I mean, finances the economies that builds this problem 
contribute to build this problem, I mean, overall, globally, interlinkages between sectors, between firms, in the financial chain, in the supply chains, etc., potentially systemic risk, and a lot of uncertainty I will come back to. Whereas, usually, the uh, traditional approach of risk um, in, in finance is quite historical, so the understanding of what can happen is essentially based on what happened already. So that's um, how I frame it as a future is a mixed replication of the past, statistical and probabilistic, <clears throat> which means relying extensively on records, on data, and on models and probabilistic models based on, on, on this understanding of the past, on, on this data of previous crisis of uh, behaviors on markets, etc. So when we state this like that, well, it seems like financial markets are not that well equipped uh, to deal with climate-related financial risk and to price them because those features uh, are not exactly the, the, the ones that we use traditionally in financial markets. If we are back to, um, to, to this, to the, to the initial um, rationale, I would say, of risk and markets and prices, um, basically, let's, let, let's come back to, to FAMA in 1970 and the uh, notion of market efficiency. And this market efficiency, thanks to information, is supposed to reflect the, the, um, the problems, the information, the facts, the knowledge into prices. But here we have an important distinction between risk and uncertainty, as seen from uh, the economic and, and financial literature. Risk in finance is seen as a probabilistic risk. So you have a bit of randomness, but you know the probabilities okay, from your understanding of the past. Uncertainty is when you don't have those probabilities. You don't know what can happen. It's unknown unknowns. Okay, The future is unknowable and unpredictable. So if you are in phrase on, on a risk, not in the words of night, uh, so uh, with statistical distributions, you can work and you can understand the price. If you face radical uncertainty, it's not the case. You cannot price something that you don't know. And so, in other words, if radical uncertainty prevails over those classical risks, price is wrong, or it cannot or cannot really occur. And so those prices on market price typically don't reflect the real, the real level of risk. That's more or less what says uh, Mark Arney in his speech, right? But what Mark Arney pushes, and not only him, of course, but all this narrative uh, is often based on, okay, so let's report, let's disclose the level of risk, and then we will help price making automatically uh, and the markets will do their job properly. It's not really a question of new rules and new regulations uh, on fundamental um, work of the financial system. It's rather on disclosure and reporting of risk. So let's uh, dig deeper in the uncertainty layer. If we focus at our physical uh, risk side. So, uh, is it a question for me? Sorry, I cannot hear. I heard a voice. Maybe it's there's an unmute microphone. Let me know if it's not the case. So um, uncertainty on the physical layer, so physical risk, okay? Physical climate change, very complex to understand. Lots of phenomena, multidimensional, non-linear, non-linear, chaotic. It's a system of lots of systems. Typically, you have the sun, you have the atmosphere, you have the cryosphere, the ice, the pedosphere, the soil, um, all the biosphere, um, the, um, the, the biomass, the forest, the plants, the animals, etc. So all that is interacting together. So if you, in a climate model, you have to model all that to have a, a good description of what happens and what can happen in the future. Okay, so it's very complex. You have uncertainty on each of these single layers, but the good news somehow is that it's driven by physical laws, by natural laws, and we know them quite well. And so even if you ha we have uncertainty, we kind of control and understand where we know and where we don't know. And we have observations where we can compare our models with, and our models, climate models, are well explaining our observations. So that's 
complex and uncertain and uncertainty content quite high, but uh, more or less, uh, um, I mean, very quite very well controlled anyway. On the transition risk, it's more complex because it's all about socioeconomic uncertainty. And here you have lots of fundamental uncertainty everywhere related to us being human. Okay, we are really unpredictable, unpredictable in, in some way. So typically the anticipation, reaction, adaptation of governments, of companies, of people rely on a lot of different possibilities. Okay, you cannot model all what a company can do tomorrow and even less in 50 years. Okay, especially uh, every, uh, every day or every week or every month between now and in 50 years. So there are vast numbers of eventualities from doing nothing to totally disrupting uh, everything. And, um, and the, one of the big issues on that is that we have to scenarize, to, to build scenarios between now and 2100. That's what we do when we do uh, climate models and uh, socioeconomic models related to, um, to climate change. So big, big uncertainty here on the socioeconomic scenarios part because a lot of things can happen. And on the resulting impact of this in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and on the effect it can have on climate change. Okay, Because for each scenario, you have a different uh, greenhouse gas trajectory. And this, of course, relies on how you understand and how you model uh, the energy processes, the transportation system, uh, the built infrastructures, agriculture, food, consumption, forest, agriculture, etc. So Lots of uncertainties everywhere. And on top of that, you have the policy tools that you can implement. And of course, you don't know exactly what can, uh, what will be implemented, what can be implemented, and what will be the impact of all of these. But if you want to imagine what will be the price or the effect of the pr on, the, on the price of a specific climate scenario in X years, you should be... Um, able or you, you would need to understand all of this as good as possible to, um, to really have a, a description, a model that helps you to, to, to show the impact on, on the price or whatever other uh, financial uh, dimension. Okay. So of course, as you understand, uh, it's very complex, especially the further you go in time, it makes it uh, more complex. And what a modeling needs to do there is to understand all these single layers and to model them concretely. Okay? And you see you have a combination of a lot of different uncertainty at the very tiny level of intra-company. How does the strategy, the, uh, the, 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 um, the operations work? how this translates into financial values, the access to capital. So you, you should be able to model that. How companies will adapt, do adapt, and will adapt in time. You don't know. I mean, you can put hypothesis, but it's, it's quite very uncertain. And how all companies will interact together all across the supply chain. This is, of course, coming with a lot of uncertainty. And at the last layer, how this will, can materialize in financial risk, in terms of market risk, in terms of credit risk, liquidity risk, et cetera. That's for one specific financial institution. And of course, in all these interact together and potentially uh, um, create uh, a systemic risk. Okay, and same again, you have to understand how you can model this to have a precise description of, of uh, future impact on, on prices. If you want to, to get it, all this into a model. Typically, it looks like this. I mean, it's a short, relatively short list and relatively simplified um, representation of what you need to take into account. This is coming from an NGFS report. Static is very complex. And then you also have interactions and dynamics, feedback loops, um, and contagion effects in the financial system. So concretely, how... Um, financial models take that into account today is layers, essentially layers of different models, starting from uh, scenarios to climate models, to trajectories, to impact on the economy, to impact on sectors, 
to impact on, fi on finance more broadly and then on financial specific parameters. So it's a, a pile of layers which comes with a, a number of complexity and limitations, but we can come back to that later. Okay, so on our uncertainty thing, well, we have a lot of uncertainty coming from both the realization of a specific scenario, of a specific event or suite of events, how we understand it, how we model it, it's two, two big questions. And then among all the multiplicity of uh, events that can occur, all the hundred thousands of scenarios you can imagine, which, are, which will occur, and of course you don't know, so you have to deal with both. And so it's a mix of complexity and multiplicity that we have to deal with. And year after year, the further you go in time, of course, the more complex it is. And, and uh, complexity and multiplicity grows exponentially with time. Okay, So that's a kind of demonstration to show that we are in the face of radical uncertainty here. And so it's re if we come back to our uh, uh, previous slide about disclosure reporting based on this computation of risk, well, it's real question whether computation of risk with our current uh, um, approaches uh, can really help, okay? So that's a bit provocative, I agree, but that's uh, the, the framework we are, we are on and what we are pushing. So because of this very fundamental uncertainty, we think that the purely quantitative approaches to financial risk models in the face of climate-related uh, risk is probably very limited. A quick layer, let me check what time is it. Uh, 10 or 6, okay, I will be a bit faster. I, I will skip a few slides, don't, uh, don't worry. I, I planned a lot just in case. Um, but uh, I will try to make it relatively short so that we have enough time to, to chat later on. Um, so what about biodiversity? I focus here on biodiversity so that it's a clear keyword, but basically the idea is to focus on environment beyond climate change. So not only climate, but also other stuff. But the first big thing you can uh, handle is certainly biodiversity. So <clears throat> the way it's approached today, as I mentioned already, is that there's a strong focus on climate-related financial risks. And so everything else is else, okay? It's an additional thing to take into account. And it's seen... I mean, it tends to be seen as a distinct category of financial risks. So it started to be uh, quite of, uh, an important focus for many institutions, including in our uh, super supervisory and central, central bank sphere. And typically, we already have um, several, and, and it's quite regular, um, publications uh, from central banks and supervisors on this, um, rather on the exploratory side, right? It's, it's even more exploratory than climate change, and it's framed as an exploration. It said, okay, we don't know, so we propose a first methodology, we dig a bit, um, uh, even if it's only scratching the surface, uh, to understand what we have in front of us. Typically, the DNBs, Dutch Central Bank, um, worked on this uh, last year, I mean, two years ago now, with the conclusion that uh, Dutch uh, financial institutions are highly dependent on ecosystem services. They have a number of about 36 percent. Uh, more recently, the Banque de France did something uh, similar, a bit more sophisticated, but on the same basis, um, with the con coming with the conclusion that all securities held by uh, French financial institutions are to some extent, dependent on all ecosystem services. So you have this dependency. So here we are far from giving a price, giving an impact on financial risk. It's exposure. So it's already very uh, clear, I would say very complex as well. But at least this exposure thing is uh, concrete and um, I would say quite um, manipulable. You see what I mean? Handable. You, you can um, have a good feeling of what you are exposed to, I would say, just having a look at um, the portfolio composition based on the, I mean, using the, the new tools and databases that exist on biodiversity. But it's far from quantifying a financial risk, okay? It's just an exposure to some ecosystem services. 
And same type of approach has been are being developed everywhere in a lot of different um, central banks and, and uh, other organizations. The World Bank is also working uh, strongly on this. But again, the ultimate objective being usually to try to find in concrete impacts and on values, on financial risks, etc. There's a kind of conclusion, to, okay, it's only exploratory work, so we need more research and we are not yet there to take concrete actions. Okay, so it's some, always a bit of the same. Okay, more research is needed. It's important. We understand there's a big threat, but we are not yet ready to handle and to manage that threat. Okay, so that's quite striking. Um, um, what else can I add here? Um, so, yes, to co conclude on, on this slide, so we have a new layer of, of focus related to, uh, to biodiversity. On climate, more, um, I mean, we see progress. So we start to open a new window related to policy options concretely, even if it's not yet there, but at least the, the policy option window uh, is open now. It's not only on exploring and trying to understand the problem, even if it's still not yet totally translated into action at this stage, but we can hope it comes. And, um, but there's no, I would say, link between the two. So the two are handled uh, separately, okay? Especially typically the one of the foremost uh, um, uh, initiative related to climate-related risks is on stress testing and scenario analysis. Yet it's totally disconnected. There is no uh, attempt to put some biodiversity related things into those approaches. Um, so I will focus quickly on this notion of sequential approach. So climate on the one hand and later on or aside uh, biodiversity, because it raises a lot uh, of concerns, we believe. First, because climate and biodiversity interact together. Okay. They are not independent. Actually, it's difficult to know which encapsulate which one because typically in climate patterns, parameters, you need to take into account uh, the biomass and uh, the capacity of the uh, of forest typically to store carbon, to absorb and to store carbon. So clearly the interaction is there. And you have phenomena that are mutually reinforced. Um, I can give you some, some, some example related to that. And so if we focus on just climate change without taking into account um, biodiversity-related phenomena, we may just miss some of the patterns and some of the risks and some of the risk factors, I would say. And at the end of the day, some of the financial risk um, that are, threat, that are um, uh, impacting um, financial institutions and the financial system more broadly. Oops, I went a bit too fast here. The other very important point is that, as we mentioned, most of the climate problem is a relatively slow and long-term problem, but um, biodiversity events and uh, catastrophes actually may occur in a much shorter time frame. And you have tipping points like that, which are on a much shorter time frame. So it's not about, okay, maybe in 30 years we will have, we will be in bad situations. When we see what happens currently, uh, think about insects, about pollinators, um, etc., about forest uh, burning, etc. It, it's really now, it's occurring now. And so the time frame is not the same. And then in terms of solution, what can be done? There are lots of lots of trade-offs and potential synergies, so positive and negative, um, between the two types of actions, I mean, the actions related to climate and or biodiversity. And there's an interaction also in the solutions, and they are not well uh, taken into account as of today. So this also uh, is a problem for the, esti the estimation of transition risks. Uh, I won't go much in the details, but um, I probably share the slides, I believe, so you, you have a bit more text to, to go into if you, if you are interested so this is on, on the um, sorry on the um, reinforcing and, and interlinkages you have some some references if you want to to dig into that uh, same i will switch i will skip this one on um, compounding risk but i come back to that just after so that's 
um, in particular, what is very important for biodiversity loss and ecosystems, how do, we work, how do they work? As for climate, they are really non-linear, okay? It works with a lot of tipping points, and those tipping points can be in the very short term. So yeah, I have to close the door of my office. Give me a few seconds, sorry. Apologies for that. Um, so those tipping points are very important in our discussion here. And if you take both together, climate and biodiversity, actually, it's not, and you, when you look at the, the science behind it, it's not just we have one, we have two, and if we take two together, okay, we sum the two, okay? It's not additional, it's not additive, it's rather compounding, okay? It means that one plus one may equal more than two, okay? Um, what is interesting, so, yes, so that, that, that's for it. So on, on the, the time horizon, I already mentioned most of, of it, but typically one example is that for climate change scenarios, typically NGFS considers uh, an impact on crop yields only from 2060, okay? Where, whereas clearly we see every year, um, essentially with soil erosion and pollinator loss, that it already affects uh, um, agriculture. Okay? And we have other ecosystems such as tropical rainforests, coral reefs, etc., which are already very much threatened and very close to their tipping points, so points of no return, where once it, when it's done, it's done. Okay? And this is occurring now, it's not for uh, four decades ahead. And on synergies, uh, maybe the simplest is I just show that to you. Um, think about the bioenergy uh, with capture and, and storage, which are types of solutions that are put forward, uh, in, including uh, in the IPCC framework to help climate mitigation, because bioenergy can be uh, first renewable and you can imagine to store as uh, a carbon dioxide created by this. Clearly, if it's good for climate, can imagine it even uh, an ultimate solution for climate. It may be catastrophic for biodiversity, essentially through this monoculture afforestation that, that, that could be needed. Okay, I don't go much in the details, but typically we are talking here about synergies, if it's positive, and uh, big bias, big trade-offs, and all that has to be taken together. Okay. Um, the good news which is somehow bad news. <laughs> uh, it's a mix of the two. The good news is that we have our two main uh, uh, scientific bodies, organizations working on this, IBES for Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, IPCC for Climate Change, which started to work together. And the first report has been released last year on addressing those problems together. So that's nice because we see those this convergence occurring. The bad news is that it only happened last year. Okay, it, was, it started last year, so it's a bit of a concern. Um, so it shows that we can de-silo that and take those two different um, big issues together. But clearly, you show, I mean, I, I try to show, uh, I hope you, uh, you, you agree or you understand my point that it adds further complexity. So it doesn't help it won't help us to, to compute the financial risk related to, um, uh, to environmental threats. Okay, it's even making our job more complex. Okay, let me go a bit faster so that um, we have enough time for discussion. Um, okay, so I summarized this already. This also probably. So let me go on the what shall we do? I will go through the different items. So let me uh, start uh, directly. So first point is very high in the agenda, not everywhere probably, but typically in, uh, in Europe and in some countries in particular, double materiality is very high in the agenda, even the regulatory agenda. Double materiality means that we are, even when we look at the financial system and financial institutions, when you talk about risk, we should not talk only about risk from environmental threats to the financial systems, but also from the financial system to the environment. What is the impact, to be very clear, how the financial system and the financed 
economy behind uh, underlying is affecting the ecosystem. And so having this kind of double uh, materiality of risk totally changed the narrative because you can imagine risks that are important for uh, this uh, mushroom here, but has no whatsoever impact on, on the financial system. If you just look at prices and financial risk, well, you can destroy all these, all these mushrooms on Earth. If it doesn't have an impact, you don't care. Double materiality is about, okay, we have an intrinsic value of nature. We have to take it into account. Okay. And when you start to do this, it's, you don't need to compute that much. You know that it's bad to destroy uh, natural ecosystems. And uh, all in all, you are pretty sure that anyway, at one point, you will have a feedback effect on your ecosystem, on your um, financial system. And so that it's better not to, to destroy everything. Okay, so this has been quite pushed a lot uh, uh, recently, and we believe that taking that into account will change the conversation and help us focus a bit less on computing financial risk, computing financial risk, computing financial risk. Um, then we know that it's a natural tendency, I would say, to compute natural uh, compute uh, financial risk in the, um, in our uh, community. So <clears throat> what is important is to change the approach also we believe uh, to relate it to that and not just use the models and the approach that we have and expect exactly the same type of results and, and, and um, knowledge from it. Typically, we have new uh, types of modeling um, that um, have been developed and are currently developed that are more comprehensive to take into account first the financial system, not just the macroeconomics, and um, nature constraints, uh, typically uh, resources, natural resources. So that's the type of uh, um, approaches that have been and, and are currently um, um, being developed. I put the examples here with input-output um, based modeling. Uh, network-based approaches where you have interaction, a lot of interaction between stakeholders that can be modeled. Stock flow consistent modeling where you take into account constraints from natural resources typically. But on the side of it, what we push is that we think it's very important to not only rely on this quantitative, um, purely quantitative, sophisticated approach, try to model everything, but rather to say, okay, we understand how the processes work. We know a lot already from science. So let's already ta start to take decisions without further modeling, right? We already have so much information from science. So let's take that and see what we can do. And first, we can ask the modelers what they did and how they understand the thing. So gather the modelers, maybe more impactful and useful sometimes than, okay, let's try to invent a new model, taking everything into account. And then uh, we think that a lot of, of decisions have to be um, based on heuristics rather than pure uh, quantitative modeling. We have to show directions. We have to explain to market stakeholders where we as a community, as humans, let's say, um, and it's pretty clear for, for climate change, a bit less for, for biodiversity, but where we can go. I mean, the Paris Agreement is very clear on that. 1.5, 1.5 to 2 degrees max. But 1.5 is an ultimate target and it comes with neutrality. Okay. And now lots of countries, lots of companies commit to it, even if it's quite of a challenge, we can discuss. But at least the target is there. So why would be why would it be ignored by financial uh, uh, stakeholders? Okay. So they have to integrate that in the way it is. Simple narratives in, to, to deal with complex decisions, like just what I said, actually, it's a simple narrative. Uh, Indicator-based approaches to deal with threshold uh, for ma macroprudential policies, typically uh, um, for um, it, it's linked to, with the other uh, related to exposure and source of, and drivers of risk, but related to specific sectors, related to um, to specific technologies, economic activities. We can have numbers specific on on for, for instance fossil fuel and say okay we can afford this amount but not more, and after uh, let's put limits typically. Um, yes, I heard a noise. No, I can continue. I, I think I'm over in the next five minutes. So that's about the same. So for us, 
these conditions of radical uncertainty from climate change, from biodiversity, and from all together, um, is um, constitute um, a call for more qualitative approaches. Okay, then uh, I cite here uh, Mervyn King, former uh, Bank of England um, governor. With uh, those four different things, ignoring information that is of little help. Okay, I mean we need to ignore information that is of little help. We need to use our experience a lot rather than always models and discretion, take decisions, developing coping strategies, uh, thinking about the future in qualitative terms. It means also imagination. We have to imagine what the future can be. And we know a lot. We, I mean, we have a lot of perception of what can happen. And reciprocally, we have lots of perception of what we are sure will never happen. Okay. And this is easy to take in qualitative terms, but in terms of model, this is much more complex. Heuristics, I already mentioned it. And uh, typically, the four big concepts we, we may rely on, on rules of thumb, bounded rationality, learning by doing, animal spirit. Think about learning by doing, typically, and the COVID crisis. It's ex exactly what we did. I mean, a lot of central banks took decisions, saw what happens on the market in particular, and revised their decision or adjusted uh, their tools uh, a few days, a few weeks later. And this is learning by doing in the face of emergency. So we, we need to move into an emergency narrative rather than, oh, we have 30 years, we will see. Let's get ready and, and prepare our models in between. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, two, two quotes here, a bit provocative again, but uh, this is also Mervyn King. It's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Okay, and we know already so much thing that we, we we are probably right about our understanding of the problem, and be precisely wrong, and that's the tendency of stress testing today because they are relying on so much hypotheses that are not realistic or not robust that potentially we may have precise numbers but are just wrong. I mean, I'm provocative again um, on, on this, but I think that's a big risk. Um, okay, let me switch directly to this. Uh, typically, this is a good news somehow is that we see this narrative uh, and this um, limitation uh, being highlighted also by, uh, by central bankers and supervisors. Typically, I take this uh, quote from um, the, this report, uh, Greens 1 and Greens 1 2, uh, from um, Luis Aguasupera uh, da Silva. Uh, Greens 1, so that's the um, equivalent of black swans, but related to um, environmental stuff, to make it quick, call less for improvements in risk modeling and more for decisive and immediate action and coordination. I think it illustrates quite well what I've been discussing today. Um, okay, I think, uh, let me know, uh, I think I'm a bit over time. I had uh, one or two additional items, but I know... It's okay. You, you can you can still talk like five okay. minutes of time now. Yeah. Okay. Thank Stay you. Time. So thanks a lot. So okay, I, I need two seconds to check which one I will take. Um, okay, I come back on one keyword I haven't mentioned, um, which is finally our outcome. What we propose is to change the mindset. I mean, I probably explained that already. We need to consider our problem differently. And for that, we propose to take a precautionary approach of financial policy against the big threats, against the big risk that we know that is very clear from science, from climate science, from biodiversity science, from uh, ecosystem science more broadly. From that part, we know the extent of the risk. We know, roughly speaking, at least what we should avoid and what we should do. And this should serve as a guideline for all policy decisions, everything, and, uh, but not only, on financial policy and, and regulation and, uh, and monetary policy as well. Because it's all in the, uh, confronted, it's all facing uh, the, those threats that are major and that may uh, disrupt uh, the world system. So our wording on that is what we call a precautionary approach. It means we need to change and to use everything that is available, a bit like what has been done for, for COVID so far. I mean, 
focus on the emergency and take decisions that are made to help um, uh, the, the wool problem and not just, okay, we have a spare part here, a spare part there. Okay, and this uh, precautionary approach should help to trigger new decisions, new policies, or even existing tools that we already have in our basket but don't use so far for the purpose of uh, environmental dealing with environmental threats. So it, it needs to act at the root uh, of the problem. And so this precautionary approach is a narrative, is a justification for action. Let me show a, a little bit how it could do. In particular, we know what is bad. So for climate, it's very clear. It's related to, um, to greenhouse gas emissions and in particular, the use of fossil fuels. So of course, it's not the role of central bankers to ban this and that style um, or, or type sorry, of technologies, but at least it should, uh, and it already started to acknowledge the fact that some specific uh, economic activities contribute to build the long-term risk. And that's in its purpose, in its mandate to say, okay, we cannot um, um, contribute, we, we cannot um, sorry, support the fact of building the risk. We want to avoid that. So let's start to discourage or even to prohibit some of the activities that are not desirable anymore. Maybe they were, maybe it's fine. It's not yet totally forbidden, but it's contributing to build up the risk. That's the endogeneity thing we are talking about. So let's start by discouraging that from the root, from the financial uh, source of, of these activities. Of course, it requires lots of discussion, et cetera, but at least we can start to discuss now. We don't need further modeling. That's what I want to, to, to push today with you. We have clear scientific consensus on something. Typically, uh, coal is really to be banned. So we need to act now. Of course, it's complex, but for finance, it should be relatively sim simple. And uh, to give the direction, not everything has to be to done tomorrow morning, but at least that's the way forward for the next year, for the next decade, and so on. Um, and so for biodiversity, the same, the equivalent would be typically forest. I mean, deforestation has to be avoided at any cost because it's country, I mean, it would uh, uh, make our climate problem bigger and our biodiversity problem bigger as well. Okay. Of course, acceptability from the economic side um, is potentially a big issue. And this won't come from supervisors and central banks alone, of course. So it has to come with a coordination um, with governments to, to ensure so that democratically it's legitimate and it's not just a few technocrats that decide this here and that there uh, with no coordination with um, among themselves because it's an international problem and uh, with, uh, with citizens. Um, okay, I think I will stop here. Let me just have a quick look on my conclusion to see if I forgot anything, but I think uh, now that's what I was just uh, saying. So yeah, let me stop there. And sorry for being uh, a bit late. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chenate. Um, actually, I'm um, uh, after this, it is a very interesting and insightful talk. Um, in fact, we um, at uh, Highland Green Finance Institute, um, we're trying to build in the, the quantitative and qualitative models specifically for uh, climate-related risk. And uh, this cinema, this lecture, um, give, um, give us a lot of thought about it, uh, especially as you said, in, under the radical uncertainty, how can we, you know, add to the model? It's almost impossible. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, I'm totally on the side uh, respect to this issue. I, I used to be a student of uh, the author of uh, Black Swan, Nassim Taleb. Right. He, he, he raised the, the precautionary principle in terms of uh, climate change, in terms of COVID. Uh, and so when we face the, you know, complex, when we face the complexity, multiplicity, this kind of um, issue, maybe precautionary is a, is a way to go. So, so it's a very, very interesting talk. And uh, in fact, this morning, we just, uh, um, our institute, we just had a meeting with uh, uh, People's Bank of China, 
DBOC and Highland Branch. This specifically raised the issue of uh, climate-related financial risk. How can we it? Uh, what should we add into it? And I, 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 and I saw your presentation about biodiversity. Biodiversity is a very, very important aspect. Maybe we would just overlook it. We put too much yeah. concentration on climate, on the carbon, right? We, we, because it's, as you said, it's, it's actually in terms of physical risk, maybe it's more related, it's short term. And the climate is more long term. And, and the transition risk in terms of policy risk, maybe for climate, is very, very recent. That, that, that one maybe we can. So, so my, I'm after listening to your presentation, um, I'm thinking about can we, when we do, let's see, if we want to do quantitative modeling for the risk, in terms of climate-related uh, financial risk, can we put more concentration on the, let's say, transition risk or policy risk? And in terms of biodiversity, maybe we can put more our attention on the um, physical risk. How do you think about that? That's a- yeah, thank, thank you very much. So a lot of things to say, to be honest, but let me try to be relatively brief. So, <clears throat> uh, so thank you very much for, for, for the insights and, and question. Indeed, I think, so the way we propose and push this um, is a bit, I mentioned it already, a bit provocative because we know that it's not the usual way it's taken. So we propose this to show to to how to yeah to provoke um, people working on this to 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 raise flags saying be very careful that you may not achieve what you are looking at maybe you will not get the results you want you expect to take those decisions and it starts there starts to be some backlashes actually on that typically on those different uh, European institutions doing uh, stress testing you have some reports from the modelers themselves, I mean, the climate modelers saying, look, you are doing something strange. You have this pile of four different models that you use. The output of one is the input of the next one and so on. So it's a kind of sequence of four different models, typically four or five or three. And actually the underlying hypothesis of each, which are very precise and you need to be very aware of that. And it comes from climate economic science, I would say are not consistent. It means that you model, you put inputs, your inputs of your second layer, for instance, comes from uh, a first layer which doesn't have the same hypothesis and the same world. It's, they are not really consistent. They are consistent at the layer, but they don't really make sense. I mean, it's a simplification, right? But I can give you uh, some, some references later on to that. And so it raises a flag on, on the fact that it's potentially not significant not 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 sufficiently robust of course you have numbers at the end but maybe they are not meaningful so it's a big warning and it starts to be seen now whereas three years ago when we started to work on this really the understanding of um, i mean the reaction of supervisors and central bankers why was quite negative and it was understood i mean uh, we we were expecting that because it was too different from their usual patterns, I would say, and a bit saying, okay, no, you are not taking the good way, so the, the right way. So I understand it was not easy to, to deal with. Um, but we think that now people start to, uh, including modelers and economists, uh, financial economists, and start to understand that it's maybe so complex that we may not be able to deal with that level of complexity, at least in the short term. So then it opens to start answering your question concretely. I think it opens the first thing, which is, okay, let me, let's maybe spare, share our problem into two parts, the urgent decisions and the longer run. So I don't think we need to give up any effort on this modeling um, attempts, but rather say it's not the only thing. So let's, let's be uh, conscious that it will take time. And if it's for, if we believe that, okay, maybe in two years, in three years, in five years, in 10 years, we will know about that. It's very impossible to plan, of course, but let's still write, make it clear that this is not for tomorrow morning. But at the same time, we need to act for tomorrow morning. So let's differentiate the two, the immediate action, and based on what? 
and when those complex tools may be ready and can inform other decisions. And then it is probably uh, is very aligned with what you mentioned. Uh, I think there are priorities. And so instead of trying to model the full world, all systems, all, uh, all sectors, I mean, all types of industries in all regions um, to, to have uh, information about the potential impact on the long run, on a diversified portfolio exposed to the whole economy or balance sheet, maybe let's start to understand processes that are more impacted potentially in the short term and focus on typically oil and gas, okay? Instead of looking at all together and modeling limited, I mean, with less interaction, of course, it's less robust, but if it's aligned with what is expected, I mean, to understand really well one sector, one technology, et cetera, I think it can be faster and help. So this type of simplification of the problem may make uh, modeling more robust as well somehow and less pretentious uh, in, in a way, less because stress tests are somehow so ambitious that it's a bit pretentious because we try to explain how the full macroeconomic system and interaction with people and climate is working. And same, I think, in terms of time, some of those models are probably very reliable and robust for tomorrow morning, maybe a bit less for next year, but still totally okay. And maybe starting, I don't know, three years, five years, tend to be not that good because it relies on an hypothesis that the economy will be still the same. Whereas we are sure that maybe not in five years, but at least in 10 years, maybe not in 10 years, but for sure in 50 years, the economic interaction between sectors, all supply chains, etc., will be, by definition, very different. So it's maybe useless to do some types of things. So cut also probably the, the problem into uh, temporal windows and not try to do everything with the same tools. I think this would clearly help. And then, as you mentioned, of course, it, it almost means that for the, the short-term windows, transition risk may be the, the only thing to deal with or marginally uh, physical risk, but not that important. And separately work on physical risk, but with other models that are a bit relate, not disrelated. And I mean, I think cutting the problem into pieces may help and uh, the progress is in modeling. But I think the most important is to keep in mind that, okay, that's one part of the problem is to understand and to see how we can use results from modeling to decision, but still we have decision to make. And for this, I think lessons from the COVID-19 crisis is important because we see that a lots of, lots of uh, decisions that are very impactful has been taken without any modeling, just from understanding, from heuristics, from all those experts that we have all across the globe have largely enough understanding to know more or less how the system will react and they make errors, but we can adjust. Okay, And this learning by doing thing, I think, is much more uh, related to our problem, which is urgent, rather than, okay, let's model it perfectly and we'll be back when we'll have the results. So it should be constrained by time instead of being constrained by results. Maybe that's a short answer to, to this complex problem. Sorry, I've been much longer than what I wanted to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Chenay. Yeah, that's, I totally agree with you, especially think about covid especially in China, right? Without any evidence, we just put on our masks, right? That's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's one of the uh, strongest examples for precautionary principle. Okay, uh, another question in terms of, let's say, more details. Um, you know, nowadays we have a lot of sustainability, ESG taxonomies, right? In Europe and in, in China and in uh, America. So how can we incorporate biodiversity or let, let me ask you, do you think current um, taxonomy contains enough biodiversity stuff content in it? Or how can we um, put more this kind of um, content into this the standards taxonomy? So at company level, right, we can at least have a uh, due diligence where we can have a rating system for it. That's a question. 
Yeah, I think first the biodiversity thing is more complex by definition because it's much more granular, much more local. Um, it's probably, I mean, I'm not sure if we can say more multidimensional that climate, but somehow typically you don't have like one magic indicator such as uh, CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, which is a good proxy for a lot of things. Here you would need a lot. The good news is that there are recent progress on this, on new indicators that are not maybe fully robust, but quite helpful still to uh, to start to give numbers on exposure, on dependency, on impact related to biodiversity. So I think this can start already to be taken into account, even if it's not perfect, but let's start with something. Um, after, I think what what is missing so far, but it will probably come automatically is the fact of uh, putting that all together, especially in terms of solutions. When I mentioned BEX, so the, bio, the bioenergy um, uh, capture and storage, uh, bioenergy with capture, sorry, with carbon capture and storage is something that is, that yeah, if you look just as one indicator, you may miss totally the rest of the, uh, of the important um, uh, things you have to take into account. And that is quite striking, I think. And so a big progress would be to start taking all together. It's more complex. It takes probably more time. But just to to have a full figure, especially when you start to, to push a solution. If you solve climate change, but you destroy the biodiversity, well, it's not very useful. Uh, I mean, as that's oversimplistic when it's said like that, but Climate change has taken such an important, which is a good news, such an important uh, uh, role and place in our discussions all together that we tend to forget some of the other things. And clearly, we have to have a comprehensive view. I mean, life is complex, world is complex, Earth is complex, so we have to deal with complexity. And taking that together, I think, is, is the option. And we have more and more data, so I, I think biodiversity is... In, of course, more complex, but is not um, is not a fatal uh, definitive obstacle. It's just uh, okay one other layer of of complexity. But it should not be considered as a layer, but just a part of the of the system. Um, maybe just what I, I I can add on that is um, yeah. I mean, it's a bit related to scenario approaches. So so far, scenarios are very complex already because you start to, to try to imagine how the world can unroll for the next decades. But there are limits or limitations which are very strong on, on, on biodiversity. But then focusing, because it's, not, it's a global issue, but it has local implications much more. And I think dividing again the cake into small pieces, smaller pieces and focusing on one region because that biodiversity issue is very striking here and is not consistent elsewhere, uh, would help making a kind of vision of what can happen. So scenario, uh, more consistent. After just one thing I want to add, <clears throat> which is a bit related to that, is a notion of solution. I think the big issue that we will all have to face is that in the narrative, the positive narrative uh, for climate change, it's relatively easy because we have a pack of solutions say, look, we can decarbonize the world. We know more or less how to do, um, more or less. We have some technologies existing or in mind, and it's new activity. So it's positive potentially for the economy, for employment, jobs, for people, and maybe for financial system as well. It's new things to finance. The big issue I see for biodiversity where I fear, and I'm very happy to hear what you think, all of you on this, um, I fear that on biodiversity, there's a bit of excitement now because, oh, yes, it's a new thing. We have to take it into account and it's important. But I fear backlash when, if we realize that, oh, it's more complex because there are so many things we need to stop, so many things we need to slow down, to decrease. But it's not like, oh, look, I have this pack of new things we need to do. It's not that simple. It's not like, okay, it needs to be renewable energy. Here it it's a lot of little things that we have to solve, but it's not an easy solution that fits all our problem. And I think for 
a bank, for instance, a big bank or a big uh, investor, it may be a challenge because it's not like, okay, I get rid of this and I take this instead. The instead is not really ready at least. I mean, that's my perspective, but I may, I may, I may be wrong, but I'm happy to, to hear any thoughts related to that. Okay, Dr. Chinet, uh, thank you so much. Now uh, we, we share the floor with uh, other participants. If you have any questions, you can directly ask. Uh, and uh, actually, you can either ask in Chinese or in English. I'll translate for you, okay? Okay. I hope. <laughs> Yeah, you can, can you? start. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for the very practical insight. And I'm a master student uh, in Belgium. I'm interested in a question that, uh, because like you said, that it's all about sometimes about science and more about the technical question, right? So we need the principle of the uh, precaution. So we need the description. Uh, but I also noticed that... Uh, is that because we there is no clear discretion policy is set? So we so, uh, more now is more about something. The policies and the guidelines is based are based on the well voluntary basis. It's not binding because we like we need the flexible policy. Yes, yeah, so I think there's clearly a big uh, a big issue on that. Because uh, uh, it depends where we, at what level of the um, financial system typically we are focusing at. But for central bankers and supervisors in particular, it's quite easy to explain from my perspective. It's mainly, we, I mean, there is a strong issue because we are expecting or we are asking even sometimes um, organization, institutions, to take decisions on something that they are they, they were not um, uh, built to uh, to deal with so typically making choices across sectors and even technological choices uh, for climate it's pretty clear with fossil fuels and other sources of energy for typically it's quite of a challenge to expect this from a central banker for sure and so it can it's, it's logic somehow to see uh, an outcome much more on the voluntary side than something very binding. So I understand the problem. Then I think this should be, that's the, all the discussion launched by the European Central Bank about neutrality, uh, whether it's a, a market neutrality or a kind of climate neutrality. I think the big step is to acknowledge to acknowledge that the financial sector and central bank supervisors are have an endogenous role here. If you are very short-sighted, one year, two years, it's probably not the case or not significant. But when you start to extend your time horizon, you realize that if you help during the COVID crisis, for instance, airplane companies, fossil fuel companies, all the things that are relatively on the dark side relative to the green side compared to what currently what the technologies are and what we want and what we don't want. It means that you are contributing to build stranded assets and to uh, for the future and to contribute to, to construct this risk for climate change, this physical risk as well. So you have a kind of contradiction here. And once this is acknowledged by all those institutions, I think it would help uh, to take decisions that are a bit more binding to say, okay, this type of technology we don't want anymore. Not the sector, not the company, but at least this uh, is not good because we know that it will come back in X years, in two years, five years, 10 years as a financial risk. And we are fighting against this financial risk for the financial ecosystem. So I think recognizing endogeneity is the a key to start taking more binding decisions. Of course, it, it requires a bit of a change of mindset, but that's all I, I was talking about. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much. So we have another question. 
Good jam. We can talk. Oh, okay, can can you hear me? Yes. Uh, on the, on the line, um, excuse me, I got a practical question about the reality. As we all yes. know, uh, Hainan is a island region with so many different climates. Yeah, which is full of the e extreme weather such such as typhoons. Uh, so, question is, what are the uh, fashionable risks posted by the extreme weather conditions on the island, just like uh, Hainan? And can you just give me some example and to uh, expel this? I'm appreciate. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure I can be very detailed because I, I don't know the area quite well. <laughs> And mm -hmm. after what I, I mean, I can just build upon uh, uh, maybe from the financial sector uh, thing what what it what it makes me think about. What I think is what is interesting uh, these days is uh, maybe not at the supervision level or, fin or monetary uh, central bank level, but you have more and more investors and banks um, being. Um, starting to explore the physical risk, what we call the physical risk here. So what, what you mentioned, that is very localized, etc. And so make the um, uh, relaunch studies on the, um, the resilience of their portfolio related to this and that scenario and start to imagine from climate science, which can be the impact. For instance, you mentioned typhoon, whether those typhoon may be more intense, more frequent in time and when. And when, as we start to have uh, good information models from climate science on this, you can start to study the impact on the econ local economy, on the built infrastructures, etc. And what is striking to me is that the fact that this knowledge, which initially is really limited to fine to sorry uh, climate science and the weather forecast organization in the short term. Um, has been translated first to insurance company. So it's already in the financial system, but quite limited on the, um, on the liability side of insurance, I would say. And then is now transferred or propagates uh, into the asset management and the banking industry. Because of course, if you're a bank, you would prefer to know if you are um, uh, giving a loan to a company whose infrastructures are very threatened by typhoons or sea level rise or, or, um, or whatever droughts um, or anything like that. Uh, or another company where the physical assets are quite safe, even in, in the same region. And for that, you need very precise data, which opens a very concrete issue related to data for physical risk. Because if you have, even in the same district, two plants, two facilities that have almost the same address, but one is three, uh, three meters higher than the other because it's on a little bump, a little hill uh, in the street. Well, maybe it won't be flooded. Maybe it will cut its operation for three days, but nothing will be destroyed. Whereas its neighbor from the other company will be totally flooded and destroyed. And so typically what is interesting in that challenge, especially for people uh, who like to, to, to work with data, is that you need very, very precise data to be able to model the, the potential loss at this scale for two companies that have exactly the same parameters, characteristics, except one is a bit higher on the hill than the other. And this has, can have strong financial impact. To answer uh, the, uh, the, our first question, somehow uh, it shows that this granularity makes sense and modeling climate risk at this level of granularity I don't mean that it's simple, but at least it's quite straightforward because you can have the data and the way to propagate the factors of risk into a financial risk at the end of the day is more or less controlled. But if you do that for all the city, for all the country, for all the regions, for all the continent, for all the world, plus studying hundreds of scenarios, it starts to be quite complex to model. But that's why my focus on granularity is important. So I think we can afford to be very precise and, uh, and complex with very granular questions. But for macro things, it's so complex that simplifications are needed, but sometimes simplifications are misleading. 
So we need to change the way we are uh, setting the problems. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, since we have, uh, we don't have much time left, so uh, we can still accept one question. Anyone else want to ask? Okay. Um, if not, I think uh, I think that's it for today. And actually, Dr. Chinate, we're, we're very honored to have you share your insights about financial related or environmental related, right, including biodiversity related uh, financial risk. And uh, in terms of uh, re you know, in terms of the high net finance research institute, we, we, we really hope to have deeper collaboration in the future because as as the other uh, participants said in Hainan, we have uh, this biodiversity issue. In, at, at least in China, we put uh, biodiversity um, in Hainan province, we put biodiversity at, as a priority. So it's very important here. You know, we, we, we are island, uh, we're in an island with, uh, um, how do I say, with uh, very good weather. So we have a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, animals and uh, different kind of plants. So biodiversity is definitely, in terms of government, they put it in their priority. So I think we can, in the future, we can have a collaboration in terms of the research, how to say, how to have some indicators specifically for Highland area. So thank you so much. Okay, sounds good. Feel free to come back to me to keep in touch. Uh, yeah. I would be very happy of that. And uh, let me know if you need any clarification or um, if you cannot access or you don't have the full references of the different papers I, I referenced, uh, feel free, let me know. No problem. And all the participants or in either in Zoom or in another uh, broadcasting platform, you can, you, can, um, you can email us or leave the message. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a, Have nice, a nice day. Evening. Have a nice night. Nice day. Sometime. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Have bye a bye. Nice lunch. Bye. Yes, exactly. Bye bye. Thank you.